It was weird. I could hear myself breathing. <laughs> Amen. But yeah, um, even as we worship God, it's, it's at moments like these where God becomes large in our hearts. And the closer and closer and the clearer and clearer we see God, the more the impact He has on our lives. And today we'll carry on in the series called How Then Shall We Live? And today I've titled it In Awe of Christ, and we'll be discussing godly fear. And the series How Then Shall We Live follows up on Building Up, which is a series that we've been going through um, all throughout this year, which is how we are meant to build God's kingdom as believers. We know the foundation and we are rooted in the foundation that is Christ. However, how do we move forward from that in building his kingdom? And in this series, How Then Shall We Live?, we looked at a couple of aspects. We looked at the mindset that we are meant to have as believers. We are meant to carry the mind of Christ. And we saw that the key pillars of the mind of Christ were humility, service, and obedience to God. And we also looked at the life of Christ, that as believers, we're not meant to manufacture a holy life, but we are meant to exchange our lives for the life of Christ himself. We are meant to exchange our lives and depend on the life of Christ if we are to live a life that's pleasing to him. And also over the past couple of weeks, Joe has been going over First Peter in a series called Standing Firm because the very real truth is that when we live this life, there will be seasons of difficulty and um, challenges and trials and suffering. However, over the series, First Peter, we saw, teaches us to stand firm and to persist in obedience, to persist in joy, and to persist in righteousness, even in the face of grave challenges. And we do, meant to do so by depending on the spirit and the grace that the Lord himself provides. Today we'll be looking at another aspect of how we are meant to live, and we're going to look at how we are meant to live um, with regards to having, or rather with regards to the fear of the Lord. Essentially that's what we'll be talking about, and when we say in awe of Christ, we're talking about cultivating a godly fear in our hearts. Now, this is a vast topic, the fear of the Lord. And uh, hopefully in future we'll get an opportunity to unpack this further. However, in the series today, or rather in the, in the session today, we'll be seeing how cultivating what we fear allows us to secure our walk for the long term, for the long haul. Not just short term, not just the six-month excitement um, that you may get after attending a conference, but how do we walk firm and secure in the Lord um, in the long term, over years, over decades, and to see that impact last generations. We need to live in awe of him. We need to live in godly fear, and we need to live with the fear of the Lord strong in our hearts. Because if we do not, we will see that many people will not finish strong. They will start off passionate about God, but at some point in their lives, they will fizzle away. So hopefully through the scriptures that we go through, we will see that clearly today. Now, fear has become a bad word, and rightly so, because fear has overwhelmingly negative connotations. Fear is a negative word. And its association uh, with depression and anxiety and control, both in society and the church, have made fear a topic to avoid, but also have made fear some, a feeling to avoid. And the reason I say that is because all through the ages, we see the fruits of fear. We see what anxiety and depression can do to a person. We see how it can cripple them. We see how fear has been used as a control mechanism from all levels of society, from governments using fear to control their people, to people or other to fathers within their household using fear to control their children. Fear exists in all aspects, and something we need to know is that fear is a tool in the enemy's toolbox. And the enemy has been effectively using fear all through the ages. And not just in society, but even within the four walls of the church. 
Because if you even look at church history, there was a long period of time, probably centuries, not, well, not probably centuries, centuries called the Dark Ages where the grace of God was never preached or teached. And instead, the enemy preached, preached fear as a doctrine. He preached legalism and the terror of, <coughs> excuse me, the terror of judgment that comes from hellfire. And what happened was the image of God was warped and robbed believers of experiencing God's love and freedom. However, as time has gone by um, and the Lord has had the Reformation and He has seen people or that He has moved through people in various revivals, we have seen that the church has course corrected and the church has embraced the good news of the gospel founded on the love and the grace of God. And fear is not that we look to preach and legalism isn't something that we hope to push because legalism robs people of the joy of salvation. However, I believe somewhere along the way, even as we cast away all fear of judgment, many people in the church have also cast away along with that the fear of the Lord. And what we'll see from Scripture is that we cannot finish strong if this key ingredient is missing. The fear of the Lord now isn't to be afraid of Him. The fear of the Lord is to revere Him and to be in awe of Him. And I want to explain that with an example. Um, many years ago, when I was in high school, I had a French teacher, and that French teacher used to give us nuggets of wisdom from here, I mean, from every now and then. Um, and I've held on to a few. And he was a man with a, a, a very short temper. However, what he used to say is that I would rather people respect me than fear me. And the reason he said that is because he said people only fear you when you're in their presence. But respect lingers much longer. Someone will be respected regardless of whether you're present or not. Regardless of whether they've seen you for years or not, respect is something that you'll still carry in your heart for a person. However, fear is contingent on the proximity um, of that person uh, to you. And over my life, I've seen that experience, particularly in my work life, because I've had a variety of bosses. And earlier on, a couple of years ago, I had a boss who was tough. And, and tough is an understatement because how he chose to lead was he chose to lead through fear. People used to literally tremble when he would come to their offices to ask for stuff because he built an environment of fear around him. Everyone used to walk on eggshells around him. It was a stressful environment to work in. And whenever he walked into a room, literally if people were laughing and there was joy, everyone would silence and be quiet because they don't know what kind of mood he's going to be in. Now, performance used to happen, but people performed out of fear. People complied out of fear. But something that I noticed is that people used to fear him when he was around. However, when he wasn't around, people used to disrespect him. People used to talk about him behind his back. And unfortunately, people even used to insult him. He was ruling and he was getting compliance from the people. However, that fear was only subject to his proximity to them. And I remember when he resigned, there were a lot of people who rejoiced. And, and when he resigned, all of the fear that everyone had for him evaporated. It did not last because the platform upon which he used to exert authority was no longer there. Now, through that, God has been gracious, and I've been able to go through that challenging time. However, God has also been gracious in my life to give me wonderful bosses, leaders who I can look up to, leaders who I respect. And this past Friday, unfortunately, uh, my current boss uh, left the company to go um, for greener pastures elsewhere, and we had a farewell for him online. And it was an emotional one because of the kind of authentic leader that he was. He garnered respect not just with his team, but all through the organization, such that when he left, his gap has been felt. And that was how he led. He led 
by allowing trust, and because of that, many of us respected him. I, I used to work, or I still do work remotely, and that is working with minimum supervision. But part of what keeps me working consistently and diligently is the respect that I have for him and the fact that I do not want to let him down, or I did not want to let him down. Now, I say part of it because as believers, we're meant to work as if we're working unto the Lord, and that should be our motivation. But I had an additional motivation because of the kind of person that he was. And the thing is, when he resigned, that respect did not evaporate. That respect had a much longer shelf life, and that respect was something that governed our conduct when he was there, but it's also something we'll carry in our hearts, even though he's moved on to another nation far away. Now, why am I talking about fear and respect? Because I want to highlight how the fear of the Lord isn't being terrified about who God is. And the respect that I had for my boss is not what we're talking about today. Today, we're talking about awe. And awe is much deeper than respect. Awe is something that produces a response in the heart of a person which has a much deeper impact and a much longer shelf life than fear. The definition of awe is an overwhelming feeling of reverence, admiration, fear, produced by that which is grand, sublime, and extremely powerful. And the reason we are talking about this today is, to sh is because awe in the heart of a man will linger much, much longer and it's a much stronger tool, of, or rather it's a much stronger order of governance than fear. You can get compliance using fear. However, you can get much more compliance and loyalty from respect, and all the more from awe, because awe is, much higher, is of a much higher order in terms of feeling than respect. The fear of the Lord is a heart posture that governs how we live and act in relation to Christ regardless of where you are and who sees. True godly fear isn't one that controls by terror, but it's one that springs forth from a heart that has a deep reverence for God, the one that has a respect and an awe of Him. This kind of holy fear is what supports a consistent walk in holiness and compliance. We walk in compliance not because we are afraid of judgment. We walk in compliance because we do not want to let our Lord down. And because at all points, if we carry the awe of God in our hearts, that will govern how we re relate to others and also will govern how we carry the words of God. We will literally tremble at His word, not of fear, or rather not of fear that He may hurt us, but for fear that we may hurt God by the things that we say and the things that we do or by the things that we do not say and the things that we do not do. And the fear of the Lord is of a much higher order because godly fear is from God himself. It's so important that it is one of the sevenfold manifestations of the Spirit of God. In Isaiah 11, speaking about Christ and the fact that he will carry the Holy Spirit in its fullness, it says the following, And the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of the knowledge, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight, or he will delight in the fear of the Lord. It comes from heaven itself. It is one of the manifestations of the Spirit of God. And the spirit of the fear of the Lord is spirit of the fear of the Lord is something that we need to cultivate in our hearts and something we need to pray to God to garner within us. The first point I want to make is that godly fear is cultivated by constant meditation on Scripture and prayer. Psalm 119.11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, when David wrote this, the word, therefore, hidden, is a word that is hoard. If you have ever been to someone who hoards stuff, you will see that they, any space that they find to put stuff, they'll put it. And it's usually in a mess. 
However, what David is saying here is that I've piled up scriptures in my heart. Wherever I find space in my heart to put scripture, I've put it there that I might not sin against you. Why? Because when we do this, when we hide scripture in our hearts, the Lord becomes large in our hearts. He becomes more real. He becomes much closer than the God we read on the page. Now, in my personal life, over the past couple of months, there's a particular verse in Job that has intrigued me. Um, and that verse is, or rather that, yeah, that verse is Job 38, 19. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? And where is the place of darkness? Now, for context, this is, Job, um, this is God talking to Job. And we know the story of Job. He went through a lot of suffering. He lost everything. And the whole book of Job is him and his friends discussing about his calamities. But also, it is Job asking God why he went through what he went through. And what God does is he comes and he encounters Job. And one of the questions he asks Job is, where is the way to the dwelling of light? He essentially asks Job, do you know the way it do you know the way to where light dwells? Now, the reason I've been mulling over it is because that's a fascinating question to ask. Because when I, when I was going over that verse and I kept, you know, meditation isn't just reading it once. It's something that you ponder on your heart over a while. And as I ponder on that verse, I think about, is he talking about the solar system and the stars? But the more I ponder, the more I realize he's not talking about that because in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And this was before he created the sun and the moon and other light-bearing bodies. So that is not where light dwells. Light comes from another place. And that made me ponder on the power that we see in our solar system. Because the sun itself, and by the way, if any of you have studied anything about the atomic bomb, or maybe some of you here have watched the movie Oppenheimer, uh, which is about the scientists that actually made the atomic bomb. Um, the amount of power that that bomb gave off was so much so that when they were testing the bomb, they had to sit, like I think a kilometer away, they had to put a lot of Vaseline on their face so their skin doesn't get burnt, and they had to wear goggles that were pure pitch black because the brightness that were to come from the atomic bomb was so bright that it would definitely blind all of them. And the sun itself produces the equivalent of 10 to 15 billion atomic bombs worth of energy every second. It's as old as time and it has never run out of fuel. That is the amount of power that the sun gives off, but that is not where light dwells. Light is derivative of where light comes from. I'm sorry, the sun is derivative of where light comes from. Where does light dwell is the question that jo um, God asked Job. So a couple of weeks ago, I was reading Hebrews 1, 2 to 3 in the Amplified Classic. And it says, he created the world talking about Christ. He created the worlds and the reaches of space and the ages of time. He made, he produced it, he built time, he built space, he operated time, he operated space, he arranged them in their order. And verse 3 says, he is the sole expression of the glory of God, the light being, the outraying, the outraying or radiance of the divine, and he is the perfect imprint of and the very image of God's nature. Now, because I, I was meditating on Job 38, 19, when I read that verse that says, he is the sole expression of the glory of God, the light being, something went off in my spirit, similar to an atomic bomb. Because what Christ, or rather what God was saying to Job was, have you seen deity itself? And do you know the way there? He was asking Job, do you know the way to Christ? Because here we see that he is the light being. 
He is where light dwells. He is all that light ever, I mean, sorry, he is all the, the glory of God encompassed in the person, and the Bible calls him the light being. When God asked Job, he wasn't asking for a diagram of the solar system. He wasn't asking him to map out the universe for him. He was asking him, does he know Christ and where Christ lives? Does he know where deity dwells? And in that moment, Christ became large in my heart. This is not the topic I'm talking on, but I'm giving an example from my life. That Christ became large in my heart the moment the Holy Spirit illumined that text. And awe and adoration poured forth from my heart. Because in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, it says, For the God who made the light shine out of darkness made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Essentially, what that says is that deity dwells in our spirit. A light that is greater than a million suns dwells within us. God himself chose to make his home in the heart of man. And the amount of power and the amount of glory that that is, is the, the, the Hebrew says he's the sole expression of the glory of God. So the full weight of the glory of God resides in our hearts. And Christ became larger in my heart because I saw him as the exalted Lord, or rather I saw him more clearly as the exalted Lord. And this is but a small example of what hiding the word of God in your heart does. Because what it does is that it inflames awe, it produces devotion, and it inspires loyalty in the heart of a man. That is what awe in Christ is. That is what the fear of the Lord is. It's not to be afraid of God, but to see him more clearly. Because the bigger that he is in our hearts, the more we worship him. When we were worshiping earlier and when we were singing to God, that's what was happening, in each, in, I believe, in each and every one of our hearts. He was becoming much larger. And the larger that God becomes in our lives and the closer we get to him, the bigger he gets. And the bigger he gets, the gravity of who he is begins to govern every area of our lives, including our conduct. Because we revere him, we don't want to let him down. Because we see him more clearly, we tremble at his words. Not because of fear of judgment, but because we revere him, because we are in awe of him, and because we carry a holy fear of who he is. And awe and godly fear have a much longer shelf life than fear of judgment. Because fear of judgment, when you do not feel it, you will not have the restraint to govern yourselves accordingly. But the fear of the Lord and the awe of God that is on the heart of a person lingers, regardless of who sees, regardless of who hears, regardless of whether you're in public or in private. The respect and the reverence and the honor that you have for God sticks onto your heart. And the more we meditate on Scripture, the more we consciously go over Scripture in our, in our hearts and in our minds, the Holy Spirit eventually will illumine the text, and you will see Christ more clearly. You will see him in his glory, and he expands and grows large in our hearts. And that begins to impact how we act, whether or not your wife is there, whether or not your husband is there, whether or not your parents are there, whether or not your church brethren are with you, that all and the size of God in your heart begins to influence every area of your life. The more we meditate on Scripture and mull over these things in our hearts, the grander and greater God gets in the eyes of our heart. However, the opposite is also true. Because when our hearts lack an awe of God, and when godly fear is absent, the more common our Lord becomes the smaller he gets. And this is seen clearly 
or rather this is an example of it that happened in Ezekiel 8, 12. It says this, and this is God talking to Ezekiel. Son of man, have you seen what the elders of Israel are doing in the darkness? Each at the shrine of his own idols. They say, the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. These were the elders of Israel. And Israel was a nation that got the heritage of God through Moses. They knew who God was. They knew the divine qualities of God. They knew that God was omnipresent, meaning everywhere at once. And they knew that God was all-knowing, omniscient, meaning he knew all things. However, because they lacked godly fear, God was not big in their hearts. This was a truth that they knew in their heads. However, it was not what their hearts were saying. And, be, and, and as a result of that, God became terrestrial. In their hearts, God became human, like their neighbor who does not see, or their wives who do not see, or their parents who do not see, or the government who does not see when people do and sin against God. And God gets placed in the same category as humanity. These people say, the Lord does not see us. He does not see, yet they knew he was omniscient and omnipresent. He does not see, yet he sees down to the very intricate details of our hearts. They lived without godly fear, and because he wasn't big in their hearts, they downgraded him to humanity. To say, because I cannot cognitively experience God, he therefore isn't here. He does not see, and therefore we can do what we want. If God isn't big in our hearts, we will do the same. If he's not large in our hearts, we will do the same. We may not say it with our mouths, but God doesn't look at what we say with our mouths. He looks at our hearts. And our hearts will preach what it is that's going on. And we see the fruits of that in our conduct, where we act as if God does not see. We act as if he's not present with us where we compromise. Earlier on, um, as Trudy was praying, or rather called us to pray, when you decide to follow Jesus, part of what you're giving up is the world. However, if the Lord isn't large in your hearts, and if you do not see him clearly, he'll become just like a man. And whether you know it or not, you will say, the Lord does not see. And what we see, or rather what, we'll, or what we will see, or rather what your life will produce through your conduct, will preach a message of just how big God is in your heart. The way that you live and how you conduct yourself will be in direct proportion to how big God is in your heart. So this is a call to cultivate holy fear by meditating on Scripture, by worshipping God the same way we were worshipping God earlier on today, but not just on Sunday, but every single day. Get a verse and hold on to it and meditate on it, even if it's for months. Even if it takes that long for God to strike a revelation in your heart. Because when he does, and the more we do it, he becomes much larger in our hearts and he begins to govern every single area of our lives naturally. Not in a forced way, not in a way that is driven by fear of judgment, but in a way that you are loyal and you do not want to let God pray that the Lord will show you Christ as the exalted Lord in glory, because this is how we are to live if we are to remain faithful till the end. We need to live in awe of our Lord. We need to live in holy fear and godly fear. Amen. Godly fear makes us avoid evil. Proverbs 16.6 says the following, Unfailing love and faithfulness make atonement for sin. By fearing the Lord, people avoid evil. We are familiar with the love and faithfulness of Christ because it's God's kindness, his love, and his mercy that made an atonement for our sin. Our hearts rejoice at that truth. Our hearts rejoice at the truth of the gospel and the freedom that it brings by his grace. However, the writer of Proverbs speaks wisdom on how we are to consistently avoid evil. 
not by knowledge of his salvation and grace, but by the fear of the Lord. A heart that is in awe of God avoids evil and remains consistently faithful over time. It says, by fearing the Lord, people avoid evil. If the Lord isn't big in your sight, you will end up tolerating the very sins we are meant to avoid. If the Lord isn't big in your sight, you will end up tolerating the very sins we are meant to avoid. And I'd like to look at an example uh, in Revelation 2 verses 19 to 20. And last year we went over Revelation and we went over the seven letters that Christ himself wrote through John to the seven churches in Asia Minor that existed at the time. However, these letters carried within them wisdom for all ages and for all times, particularly for the body of Christ. And in the church of Thyatira, this is what Christ writes to them. He says, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and, in is, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat foods sacrificed to idols. Now, for a bit of context, Thyatira was a trading city. It was a hub of trade, and as a result, it was a collection of many cultures, and many people from many places came to congregate in Thyatira to carry, to carry out trade. It was a city that had vibrant commerce, and it attracted people from various backgrounds and culture. And in the midst of this city, and amongst many competing cultures and influences, there was a faithful church. There was a faithful church by Christ's own declaration. Because Christ himself commends them for their love, for their faith, for their service. And he commends them saying that they are making consistent progress. So this was a thriving church. However, Christ had one issue with them, and that was tolerance. They tolerated Jezebel. Jezebel was not her name, but there was a prominent woman in the church at the time who was teaching and undermining spiritual integrity by promoting tolerance and accommodation and participation in pagan practices. The church began to have a mixed crowd of people who would partake in pagan practices, and someone in the church was saying that it's okay. It's okay. And the people who didn't partake also tolerated it because they saw no problem with it either. Those who were swayed by Jezebel's compromise sought to, in the name of love and acceptance, tolerate and participate in the ways of the world. And because it was a trading hub and there were a diverse amount of cultures in there, they were really having a taste of culture from all parts of the globe. And in order to appeal to them, they felt that it was okay to partake in what they were partaking of. These believers weren't avoiding evil, they were tolerating it. And this was indicative of the lack of godly fear. Because in Proverbs it says, by fearing the Lord, you avoid evil. But these people were not avoiding evil, they were tolerating it. They were making accommodation for it. I want us to understand that this church understood the unfailing love and faithfulness of God. They understood the grace of God and their salvation. They were moved by it, and they had commendable works as a result. For Christ himself to say, I see the love that you have, I see the faith that you have, I see how you serve one another, I see how you love one another, and I see how you're making progress. I see that you're thriving as a church. However, he had one problem, and that was tolerance. And what Thyatira shows is how the natural evolution of compromise and tolerance led not only to the acceptance of sinful activity, but it also led to the participation in it. They did not fear God, and their hearts saw him as Savior. However, their hearts never saw him as the exalted Lord. He was not big enough in their hearts. 
he wasn't big in their sight, and hence they started to make accommodations for sin. They lacked the natural restraint that comes from a healthy and holy fear, one that avoids sin whether in public or in private, whether with fellow believers or in the marketplace amongst the world. I have a quote here from John Flavel that says the following, The carnal person fears man, not God. The strong Christian fears God, not man. And the weak Christian fears man too much and God too little. This church feared God too little. And hence, they never avoided evil, but they accommodated it. And what was the result? Unfortunately, history tells us that this church didn't last very long. And the witness of Christ in the territory was snuffed out. So much so that there is no church there today in an obscure part of Turkey. And there are no known believers in this area. We're talking about building up. And we've been talking about that the whole year. And when we build, we count the cost because what we build, we hope, will last long. No one builds a house expecting the house to crumble within two years. And you count the cost because it's going to give you, it's going to take a lot from you. And when we build, we hope what we build lasts. The church in Thyatara buries barely survived a generation. This is important to ponder because Thyatara was a thriving church, loving, faithful, patient, enduring, and thriving. These are characters, or rather these are traits of a successful church. These are all the markings that we would like and look for in a church today. If they are loving, if they are faithful, if they serve one another, if they love their neighbors, and if they continue to thrive and the impact continues to expand. We need to ponder these things because God in his goodness and mercy is developing and has been developing these positive traits here in God's tribe church. We're celebrating our 11th anniversary next year. And these are the positive traits God has garnered over the years in our church. And not just in our church, in churches across the city and in pockets throughout the city, God is perfecting his love. He's, per he's raising up faithful people, people who are patiently enduring and also who are thriving. However, if we are to last beyond a couple of decades, if we are to last and to leave a lasting witness for Christ that outlasts everyone in this room, then we need to heed the warning. We need to look at the anatomy of the church in Thyatira. Because they had all of the positive character traits, however, they did not last. And why they did not last is because there was one component missing, and that, that component was godly fear. God commends them for their good work, but because of the toleration, or rather that they tolerated sin, the witness got snuffed out, and they didn't last. If we are building up, and we're to build up something that our kids and our kids' kids can take our baton from us and to carry on building the kingdom of God, we cannot miss this key component. We can have all of the other positive markings, but if godly fear isn't there, we will not last. If the awe of Christ isn't fastened securely in our hearts, we will not survive. They rejoiced in his salvation, but they tolerated sin. Thyatara shone for a season, but as I said, they did not last. May that not be the story of our church and other churches in this territory, that generations from now there is no witness in the city because we lacked godly fear, because the body of Christ in Dar es Salaam lacked godly fear, because of the body of Christ in our region lacked godly fear. We can have the love, the faithfulness, the patience, the endurance, we can have all of those positive markings. However, if godly fear is absent, we will not last. I did not put it up there, but Matthew 7 talks about building. And in Matthew 7, if you read it in your own time, Christ says, 
at the end of the age, many people will come to him saying, Lord, didn't we serve you? And to some of them, he will say, I did not even know you. And he will dismiss them. And then he says, therefore, meaning as a result of this reality that many will be disillusioned or some will be disillusioned when they come to Christ. He says, a wise builder builds on the rock. And when the storms come, the building withstands it. He says, a foolish builder builds on sand and when the storm comes, the building gets washed away. What we're talking about is longevity. And Christ himself explains that analogy because he says, the wise person is he who hears the word of God and does it. And the foolish person is he who hears the word of God but does not do it. It's people who are hearing the word of God, meaning people who are in the proximity to where the gospel is being preached and where the truths are being preached. However, the wise one is the one who hears and does, and the one who's unwise is he who hears and does not do. And one building lasts, the one that's on the rock, and one fades away and crumbles when the storms come. That's the one built on the sand. Godly fear cultivates within us an ability to tremble at the word of God, to hear his words and to follow what he's saying because we revere him so much. That is what building on the rock is. The more we build on the rock, the longer our witness will last, not just in, the life, in our lifespans, but in the lifespans that span generations. How are we meant to live? We are meant to live in awe of Christ if we are to build something that lasts. I have a quote here from John Bevere, and he wrote a book, The Awe of God. It's an amazing book. I encourage you to get it. Backsliding does not occur the moment a person finds himself in bed with someone who they do not have a marriage covenant with. It doesn't start the moment a person finds himself embezzling money from their employer. It starts long before, when we begin to tolerate what Jesus gave his life to free us from. What do I tolerate that Jesus died to set me free from? That is a question we all need to ask ourselves. What do we tolerate that Jesus himself died to set us free from? Because how we are meant to live is with a godly fear and an awe that sees us follow what Christ says, follow his teachings, not for fear of judgment, but because we do not want to let him down. May the Lord be at large in our hearts as we meditate on scripture. May he grow to the point where when we see who he is, we go on our knees in adoration. And when we get up, we have, um, we have the respect and reverence on our hearts that will govern our conduct regardless of wherever we find ourselves. If we are to build his kingdom, one that will last generations, we need to live with a healthy and holy fear of God. And it's not just in the Old Testament where we see the fear of the Lord. Paul spoke about this constantly. And whenever Paul wrote to a church, he was writing with the wisdom so that they last long after he's gone. In Hebrews 12, 28, he says, since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping him with holy fear and awe. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1, Therefore, since we have these great and wonderful promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, completing holiness, living a consecrated life, a life set apart for God's purposes. How? In the fear of God. And in Philippians 2.12, this is Paul writing at the end of his life to the church in Philippi. He says, dear friends, you always followed my instructions when I was with you. And now that I'm away, it is even more important. Work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. Paul, towards the end of his life, was telling the Philippian church that you have been going strong. Well done. But he's saying, now that I'm away, it is even more important that you hold on to this truth. Because Paul was about to die. And he didn't want 
the church to go off the rails because Paul has died. So he leaves them with wisdom. He says, you've been doing good so far. However, it's more important now that you work hard to show the results of your salvation. How? By obeying God. How? With deep reverence and fear. He was saying, if you're to outlast me, because he was nearing the end of his life, this is how you should live. When you near the end of your life, you do not mince, or you do not mince words and you do not waste words. And what Paul was saying is, this is how you will survive, even when I'm gone. To obey God with deep reverence and holy fear. Holy fear fastened onto the heart of a believer is a natural repellent to sin. Those who overcome sin and make consistent progress over a lifetime are sure to cultivate it. But like any garden, cultivating is a conscious effort and an intentional one. It does not happen automatically. How then shall we live? We shall live in the fear and the awe of our Lord. The fear of the Lord is clean and it endures forever. That's what Psalms 19.9 19, 19, 9 says. If we're to build something, a kingdom, and the kingdom that God has given us is one that will last forever. But if we are to participate in building a piece of it that's going to outlast generations, the fear of the Lord is clean and it endures forever. We need that component in our hearts and we need it in our lives and we need it in our churches. May we stand as I close. I have a quote from Spurgeon that says, as the creator of all things and all beings, he has the right to the obedience of all the creatures he has made. Again, I say that we who believe in Jesus are not afraid of God even as our king, for he has made us also to be kings and priests, and we are to reign with him through Jesus Christ forever and ever. Yet we tremble before him, lest we should be rebellious against him in the slightest degree. With a childlike fear, we are afraid lest one revolting thought or one treacherous wish should ever come into our mind or heart to stain our absolute loyalty to him. We preserve our loyalty to him. May nothing come into our minds or hearts that stains our absolute loyalty to him. I have a final slide up there because the fear of the Lord isn't just about longevity, but it also comes with its blessings. And we don't have time to unpack that, and hopefully we may unpack that at a point in the future. However, I'd like for all of you to take a photo of that and in your own time, meditate on those words. Even if you take one or two of them and you meditate on them over a period of time, it may even be months. But just meditate the promises that the fear of the Lord brings. The meditate the promises that God speaks about to those who fear him. He promises wisdom. He promises intimacy. He promises wealth. He promises security. And as we, and as we meditate on these, may he become large in our hearts. May he become large in our hearts that the gravity of who he is begins to affect our conduct in every area of our life. We are about to have communion today, and um, even as we are standing, can we go and grab the elements and then we'll pray in closing. We have four stations, I think. Yeah, we have four stations, two in the back and two in the front. So please go ahead and, and, and take the elements and come back and stand and then we'll partake together and pray.
even as we hold the elements, let us close our eyes and let us pray before we partake. Father God, we come before you. You see our hearts. We acknowledge, Lord, that you are our exalted Lord. I pray now that, Lord, you may minister to our hearts and speak. Show us the areas of our hearts, Lord, where we are tolerating sin. Show us the areas, Father God, where we have not seen you as the large and exalted Lord seated on the throne and where we have treated you as common, where we have treated you as if you do not see. Forgive us, Lord. Have mercy on us. And we pray, Father, that you may provide what only you can provide, that you may baptize us in the spirit of the fear of the Lord, that from your throne you may, Lord, fasten upon our hearts your truth and the truth of who it is that you are. May our hearts be filled with awe of you. May you become larger and larger in our hearts and in our sight. I pray, Father God, that the impact and the gravity of your being impact our lives in significant ways. Father God, we pray, even as we build and even as we look to participate in what it is you're building, may you teach us, Lord, teach us to cultivate godly fear. And even as we meditate on your words, Lord, may you become all the more real to us. May you become large in our sight. May we bow down and worship you, Lord, and as a result, going out into the world in absolute loyalty to you. May the respect, reverence, and honor that we have for you outlast our lives. May it be the very thing that we hand over to the next generation, and that as we teach them, we teach them the ways of how to cultivate godly fear, amongst other things. As we proclaim the truth of the gospel, I pray that the, your fear, Lord, continue to expand and grow, not only in our church, but in the churches in which you're operating in across the city, in the churches in which you're operating in across this nation. Father, we thank you for your great sacrifice, because it is through your sacrifice, through your body and your blood, that we have eternal life. We rejoice at your love. We rejoice in your faithfulness in atoning for our sins. And even as we remember you today with the elements, I pray, Lord, that these realities be fastened onto our hearts. 1 Corinthians 11.23 says, For I received from the Lord what I have also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us partake. Amen. Thank you, Arthur, for sharing that word. I want to encourage us. I'm sure each one of us could sense that the Lord was talking about the same thing since the beginning of the service. So we have our own personal homework for us to really think about what we've heard today. You know, the Bible talks about the man who looks in the mirror and then walks away and forgets what he looks like. May, we, may it not be us. May we meditate on what we've heard and meditate on the scriptures that, we've, that Arthur has faithfully shared. I want us to um, share the closing. Actually, before we do the closing, just reminders. Baptism, baptism class after the service, soon after the service, if you'd like to join that or just interested in asking questions, please come and see Joe after the service. Um, 
evangelism class next week, Sunday, after the birthday celebrations. Next Sunday is also birthday celebrations. Please bring a friend along if you'd like to do that. And um, the retreat, marriage retreat, CFA, and the singles, also CFA. May we share our closing passage together. Hebrews 13, verses 20 and 21. Now, may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip us with everything good that we may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. There's refreshments outside. If you like some coffee and tea, karibuni. If you'd like prayer for anything, you can also come to the front. There'll be people to pray for you. Have a great Sunday. God bless you.